Let me ask you just a, a question, and we'll have a show of hands, audience participation to get started here this morning. How many of you like to win? Yeah, amen, right? Uh, there's a, a couple of sayings uh, about winning. You may have heard some of these. A winner says, uh, I'm good, but not as good as I ought to be. A loser says, I'm not as bad as other people. Uh, a winner listens, a loser just waits until it's his turn to talk. <laughs> There's some wisdom in that. I know Solomon didn't say that, but, eh, you know, <laughs> pretty close. Uh, when a winner makes a mistake, he says, I was wrong. When a loser makes a mistake, he says, it wasn't my fault. Yeah, amen. Um, listen, we all, we all want to be winners, Amen. Uh, but sometimes, sometimes it doesn't work out that way. Uh, sometimes, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we face defeat. Um, you guys know who the Harlem Globetrotters are? Michael, this is where you come in. All right, just, uh, just enjoy the next minute and 15 seconds or so. If Michael can pop this up on there. You'll have to hit the switch to turn it back to uh, that uh, output. And then make sure we're at the beginning of the video. There you go. Now hit play down there. Sound if you got it. Okay. Okay. My screen, Michael. <laughs> okay, the Harlem uh, Harlem Globetrotters. Many of you are uh, old enough to remember and really enjoy them back in the in the day. Um, the Harlem uh, Globetrotters, for a while there, had a historic winning streak going of 8,829 games. <laughs> That's a pretty good winning streak. Uh, but back in 1995, um, on September 12th, they uh, their eight 1,829 game winning streak uh, was broken on a trip to Vienna, Austria. Uh, they played a, a team filled with retired basketball stars, uh, including uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, and uh, they lost 91 to 85. Okay. Now, uh, uh, Reggie Phillips, one of the, one of the players, uh, told the media this. He said, after being part of the team for over 300 straight wins, that was just his part of the, his career, the career, it's a strange feeling to lose a game. Now, they did defeat the All-Stars the next game. <laughs> but a winning streak of 8,829. Amen? Uh, that's, uh, that's a pretty good, pretty good winning streak. Turn, 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 if you will, in your Bibles to uh, Acts chapter 27. Acts chapter 27, and I'm looking at the time, and I'll try to kind of make this uh, uh, somewhat brief. You pretty much know the story, but take a look down in verse 4. Uh, this is obviously the story where Paul goes through with a shipwreck. Uh, he had been uh, uh, tried with uh, Agrippa, and he had appealed to Caesar, and so Agrippa had sent him to Rome, and this is uh, an account of the beginning of that uh, journey as he's on his way to Rome. And down in verse 4, we pick it up. And when he had launched from uh, thence, he, uh, we sailed under Cyprus because the winds were contrary. Um, and when we had sailed over uh, the sea of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we came to Myra, a city of Lycia. Uh, and there a certain centurion found a ship of Alexandria sailing into Italy, and he put us, uh, uh, put us therein. And when we had sailed slowly many days, 
and scarce were come over against Sindus, the wind not suffering us, we sailed under Crete over against Salmon. Uh, and hardly passing it, came unto a place which is called the Fair Havens, nigh whereunto was a city of Latia. Um, now, when much time was spent, and when the sailing was now dangerous, because the fast was now already passed, Paul admonished them, and said unto them, Sirs, I perceive that this voyage will be with hurt, and much damage, not only of the lading of the ship, but also of our lives." Nevertheless, the centurion believed the master and the owner of the ship more than those things which were spoken of by Paul. And because the haven was not commodious to winter in, the more part advised to depart th thence also, if by any means they might attain unto Phoenice and there to winter, which is an haven of Crete and, the, and lieth towards the southwest and, nor and northwest. And when the south wind blew softly, supposing they had uh, obtained their purpose, losing, th losing thence, they sailed close by Crete. But not, lo not long after there arose against it a tempestuous wind called Eurocladon. And when the ship was caught and could not bear up into the wind, we let her drive. And running under a certain island, which is called Claudia, we had much work uh, to come by the, sh by the boat, which when uh, they had taken, they, taken up, they used helps undergirding the ship and fearing lest they should fall into the quicksand, strike sail, and so we were driven, undergirding. They, they took ropes, started at the front of the ship, drug them back, and tied them up so that ship wouldn't come falling apart. That's, that's what they're worried about doing, right? They're undergirding the ship. Uh, and eight, verse 18, we being exceedingly tossed with a tempest, the next day they lighted the ship. That is, we threw everything overboard, make sure we could still float. The third day we cast out with our own hands the tackling of the ship. We're getting rid of all the gear. And when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared, and no small tempest lay on us, all hope that we should be saved was then taken away. But after a long absence, uh, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, ye should have hearkened unto me, and not have loosed from Crete, and to have gained this harm and loss. And now I exhort you to be of good cheer, for there shall no loss of any man's life among you, uh, or there, there shall be, excuse me, no loss of any man's life among you, but of the ship. For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar, and lo, God hath given thee all of them that sail with thee. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God that it shall be even as it was told me, howbeit we must be cast upon a certain island. And then uh, 14 nights, uh, they, they continue. You see that in verse 27. Uh, and before too awful long, t verse 29, fearing lest we should have fallen upon rocks, they cast anchors out of the stern and wished for the day. Um, a, bunch of grew, a bunch of folks in verse 30 tried to uh, escape and flee in the lifeboats. Paul said in verse 31, except uh, ye abide in the ship, ye cannot be saved. Uh, so those guys decided to stay in the ship because they're listening to Paul now. They cut off the ropes of the boat and let her fall off. And when the day was uh, coming on, verse 33, Paul besought them to take meat, saying, This day is the 14th day that ye have tarried and continued fasting, having taken nothing. Two weeks they've been in a storm, in a ship, eating nothing. Wherefore, I pray you, take uh, some meat, for this is for your health, for there shall not a uh, hair fall from, the head of you, from any of you. Um, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father, uh, again, we thank you for the word of God, for, um, uh, Lord, the things that you chose to put in this book. They're great illustrations of what some of our forefathers have gone through. I just ask now that you would settle our hearts, settle our minds, help us to be attentive to the things of God, uh, help us to maybe see Jesus Christ and the cross of Calvary and what he did for us in a little different light than maybe how we've seen it before. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I titled this message very simply, uh, Finding Victory uh, Through Defeat. Finding Victory Through Defeat. So in Acts 27, we have the, the familiar account of, of Paul's trip to Rome. Um, we, know, you know, we know that ultimately the Apostle Paul was a winner, right? Uh, obviously, he came out ahead. He was a, a phenomenal Christian. He was an example for all of us. We all try to emulate ourselves after him as much as possible. He was a winner. Um, he won the race. He finished his course. He kept the faith. Brethren, it doesn't get much better than that for the child of God. Amen? 
Uh, but along the way, he faced many, many, many defeats, right? Many setbacks, many struggles. Um, one of the outstanding things about the Apostle Paul was that he always seemed to learn from his defeats. He didn't let the defeat stop him from doing what he was supposed to be doing. Um, in fact, I would go so far as to say this, that Paul's defeats were really a very critical part of his success. Amen? Amen? Um, if that's the case, maybe you should look back in your life and rethink some of the defeats that you've experienced. That's good, Amen? Maybe there are some things in there that will help you be successful after all. And also, when you move forward and you face a lot of defeats, you got to keep this in mind because it's very easy to get discouraged when you're facing a defeat. Now, I don't know if you uh, have a habit of having 8,829 uh, you know, wins in a row before you face a defeat. Probably not. <laughs> that's, a lot of, that's a lot of success. Um, but listen, those failures that you had in the past, you should learn something from them. Amen. Right? Uh, there, there are just things to be learned through defeat. And one of the first things that you need to learn through defeat is simply, uh, simply this. Facing, facing a defeat, ladies and gentlemen, shows you what you're made of. Now it says uh, in Acts 27, it says, And said to them, it's, this is Paul, Sirs, I perceive that this voyage will be with hurt and much damage, not only of the lading and ship, but also of our lives. So the Apostle Paul right here has been, you know, sentenced or he's been shipped off to, to Rome because he's appealed to Caesar. And he has faced, if you know anything about his life, he's faced plenty of defeats in the past. And now he's aboard the ship. And folks, at this point in time anyway, even he doesn't know exactly what's going to happen. They're going through, uh, you know, they're going through trial after trial after trial. And, uh, you know, Paul in the past has already been a prisoner right? He's been, he's been beaten. He's been, you know, just time and time again, he has faced defeats and setbacks and challenges. Um, and now he's aboard this ship. And from the moment they took off until this particular time right now, in fact, until the voyage ends, it is just one defeat after the next, one setback, one, one more thing going wrong. The wind doesn't cooperate. They, uh, you know, they, they run up on a storm. There's, they're not in a great place to stay. It's the wrong time of year. One defeat after the next, after the next, after the next. And here's Paul in the middle of all this, and he's got to suffer in that ship with the rest of the crew, right? Like I said, in verse 10, he was concerned for his life as well. Now, I don't know what that Eurachlodon was like. I'm sure it was quite a mess. 14 days without eating for sailors, that's not a good thing, right? Uh, and then, of course, we didn't, uh, you know, get into a real great detail about the shipwreck, but then... Uh, then, they, then they wound up uh, being shipwrecked on that island. Of course, you know the story. He got bit by a poisonous snake, and he was healed and all that kind of stuff. But, but the, the, the point that I'm trying to make is, listen, you're going to face defeats. And when you begin to face those defeats, you're going to begin to find out what you're made of. Amen. Right? It's easy to be on top when you've won 8,829 games in a row. It's easy to have confidence when you've won 8,829 8, games, right? I think their overall, I think their overall record from the time they started, I think it was back in the 1920s. Um, they're, they're, at the time of the article, anyway, their record was like 27,000 wins and about 345 losses. <laughs> but it had been so long that that one guy on the team hadn't even experienced defeat. Listen, Paul has faced some defeat. But one of the things that you learn in defeat is you learn a lot about yourself. You learn what you're really made of. Amen? Um, you guys uh, remember General Wainwright. And I, uh, that's the, I'm sorry, that's the, that's the journey. 
that, um, that they wound up taking. And that little wavy line there in kind of the center of the picture, that's when they really started hitting the big waves and the, the Eurocladon, and that's when they had the big mess. Um, you guys remember uh, World War II, the Philippine Islands? We talked about that uh, a little before. I talked about General Wainwright. I, I got a book on, uh, of his story. It's just incredible. But um, uh, these little islands over there, and of course Japan came down, invaded the Philippines. I'm, I'm not going to take a lot of time to go over all that. But uh, that little area that's circled is uh, Bataan. That's the Bataan Pen Peninsula. And of course, the Japanese started coming in from the north and from the east and the west. They landed, and you know they're they're attacking the American and the uh, Philippine forces there. And of course, they marched them all down to the tip. That red circle is where they um, uh, where that that uh, small red circle is a little island off of the Bataan Peninsula called Corregidor. And as all the, uh, all the American forces are gathering on that big peninsula, General Wainwright wound up moving his command center down to the island of Corregidor, which is where General MacArthur was. And the, the Japanese just started coming down the, the east and the west sides of, the, of that island and just started just wreaking havoc through that whole, through that whole, um, um, through that whole battle. They, um, you know, like I said, as, as, as J Japan continued to advance, uh, General Wainwright wound up having to move his headquarters to that small little island. That small little island is about that big in comparison to that small little peninsula that was across that great big island. A very small rock. They referred to it as the rock. And uh, you know how that main battle went. That main battle came, you know, came down and the Americans got funneled down to that peninsula. And uh, General Wainwright had, the, had an order from MacArthur, do not surrender. In fact, uh, General MacArthur told him this, when the supply situation becomes impossible, there must be no thought of surrender. You must attack. That's his orders. You find out an awful lot when you begin to face a defeat after defeat after defeat, and then when you watch the men under you get defeated and, and just mercilessly slaughtered. It's a heavy responsibility. Nobody likes to have to go through it. And he gets down through that, uh, through that whole thing, and he's ordered not to surrender. But in, in, uh, in the meantime... He's no idiot. He knows there is no way we're going to win this battle. They're running out of men. They're running out of food. They're running out of supplies. They're going on half of half rations already. Not even half American rations. They're going half Philippine rations. And it's just the, the situation is, is dire. And General Wainwright knows there is no way that we are going to win this battle. And yet his marching orders are don't surrender. On, um, like I said, he defaced de defeat after defeat after defeat as Japan advanced through that island. Yes, in the beginning, we outnumbered the Japanese. But that situation quickly turned as we began to lose a lot of people, and Japan kept reinforcing on that island. And now we're in a situation where they way outnumber our forces. We're overwhelmed in number, and, and we, we don't have any anti-aircraft weapons. Um, and, you know, we don't have the weapons to win. We don't have the manpower to win. We don't have the position to win. We don't have food to feed our soldiers. And yet he is facing defeat after defeat after defeat with orders not to surrender. And he keeps on fighting. We're getting, they're getting stronger. We're getting weaker. They're being resupplied. Our supplies are dwindling. Yet he stayed the course. Proverbs, uh, Proverbs 25, 19 says, confidence in an unfaithful man in time of trouble is like a broken tooth or a foot out of joint. Right? You know what you want to be? You want to be a, a faithful man. Even when trouble comes along. Even when people start talking bad about, quote, your church. <laughs> right? You want to be a faithful. Why? Because we're, we're here for something much bigger. Amen. Right? 
But, but General Wainwright was facing defeat after defeat after defeat, and he, he knew, he, he, like I said, he was a tactician, he was a smart man. He knew they were facing defeat, but yet he had orders to continue, um, continue fighting. Paul knew once the Lord told him that he was going to make it out alive, and he had full confidence in that, in that shipwreck, but up to that time, he wasn't so sure. And even after Paul said it, I'm sure there was a lot of people in the ship that didn't believe it. What's the point? Hey, listen, the point is um, you don't really know what you're made of until you're put through some trials and some tests. Amen. How's your Christianity going to stand up? You don't know. You don't know until you have to face some trials and see if you actually have the courage and the strength to stand up and stay strong as a Christian. I'm reading that book about General Wainwright, and I'm going, man, that was one tough old dude, man. That's one tough old dude. I tell you what, facing defeat shows you what you're made of. I'm going to have to hurry along. Facing defeat, um, facing defeat, ladies and gentlemen, will also show you this. It shows you what your enemy is really like. All right? It shows you what your enemy is really like. It said in Acts 27, 20, you got that shipwreck going on, when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared. And we haven't even seen the, we haven't even seen the sun or the night. It's, this storm is so bad for many days. All right? No small tempest lay on us. All hope that we should be saved was then taken away. This is before the Lord told him he was going to be saved. So, so they're out there in the middle of that storm, and Paul's out there with this in the ship, and this thing is so bad, he said, uh, all hope was taken away that we were going to be saved. We all knew we were going to die. You know what the devil will do to you? Listen, the devil will take you, and the devil, the devil will put you through so many things, just literally trying to take your hope away. He's trying to destroy you. He's got no use for you having any kind of success at all. Right? That's, that's what the devil is after. Listen, when you, when you face defeat and you face something like what Paul went through on that shipwreck, you, listen, you know the devil was trying to stop Paul from getting to Rome. Now, ultimately, the Lord's in charge. But, you know, but those people on the ship, they didn't know that. And you know what you're going to find? You're going to find, ladies and gentlemen, that if, if you, if, if you <laughs> as you face defeats in your Christian life, you're going to see that the devil does not care one little bit about rather you wind up as a homeless bum in the gutter somewhere in your own vomit, filthy, nowhere to go, no money, no food, no hope. That's what the devil thinks of you. You say, oh, he wouldn't do that to me. Oh, yeah, he would. Yeah, he would. You know, none of us like to, to, to have defeats. Every once in a while, every once in a while, you know, we, we face defeat. But what that defeat should do is open our eyes to see that, hey, our enemy does not have our best interest in mind. Listen, um... Um, <clears throat> the, devil, the devil was not interested in Paul making it to Rome. Look at what he did along the way. The devil is not interested in having any kind of mercy on you at all. He's interested in leaving you in the gutter or worse, right? Many good men die in war. The devil doesn't care. Listen, many good preachers have died at the hands of the devil. The devil doesn't care. If we could just have our eyes open and get a glimpse of, of what the devil really had in store for us, what he would like to do with us, our whole outlook towards God would change. Amen. We would run to him for protection. Amen. But people don't see it. People don't see it. Paul had a chance to see how the devil would treat him. 
Job had a chance to see how the devil would treat him. I mean, God put limits on it, but the devil still had a little bit of free reign, and look what he, look what he does to his people, right? Um, the, Japanese, the Japanese in that, um, in that battle showed some of their honor. You know, I mean, I'm a martial artist, and I like whoosh, sword, and you always th stand up, and you, you, you think very highly. In the martial arts, you're very highly, you're, you're taught to think very highly of oriental honor. And, you know, I don't want to lose my face. That kind of thing, right? And, and there is an aspect of that. But let me tell you something. During that war, <laughs> brethren, that was all out the window. They showed, on the surface, they talk about honor and integrity, and they have this very, you know, prim, proper etiquette that they have in their society, and that they try to develop it in a culture, but it is, it's a very, um, it's a very worldly, a very fleshly, very prideful honor. It's not spiritual, because when push comes to shove, you begin to see what that honor actually produces. And those Japanese began to come down on that island. I've lost track of where I'm even at. <laughs> um, those, those Japanese began to come down on that island, and they began to destroy things. And you, you've heard about the Bataan Death March. We talked about that a couple weeks ago. I won't go over that again, all the atrocities and everything that happened. But, but, um, but they, began to, uh, they began to bomb, uh, <clears throat> and they made it down to that, that peninsula down there. And, of course, General Wainwright wind up going down to that little island of Corregidor, and him and what's left of his command structure were on that little itty-bitty island just being shelled and shelled and shelled. The Japanese came through and, um, uh, and bombed a hospital, clearly marked, which is a dishonorable thing to do. You don't do that in war. Uh, this is one of the... Uh, one of the uh, telegrams that General Wainwright sent. Superior enemy forces supported by tanks and artillery continue to attack the center of our line in Bataan. The Japanese have thrown fresh reserves into the fight and have, have made some progress. Heavy losses have been sustained by our forces and by the enemy. Japan dive bombers are assisting in the attack, dropping bombs and machine gunning our frontline soldiers. The enemy gain, uh, again bombed one of our field hospitals inflicting heavy casualties among wounded soldiers undergoing treatment. The attack was carried out this morning by three flights of heavy bombers. This same hospital was bombed only a few days ago, after which the Japanese high command broadcast an apology. Today's attack on this plainly marked hospital, following so closely on the first attack, tends to prove that both raids were intentional. Like I said, we talked about the death, uh, the, the death march in Bataan. But then they, uh, they began shelling that, that island, and they knocked out all of our artillery. Our artillery couldn't shoot back during the day because if they shot, the smoke from, our, our, from the gun would give away their position, and the Japanese would, would hone in on it and destroy the guns. They were down to like two guns left, and they could only fire back at night. So all day long, they sat there and just endured bombardment after bombardment after bombardment. On, uh, on April 7th, on April 7th, the general, uh, this is right before, right before the Bataan March began, on April 7th, General King on the, on the peninsula contacted General Wainwright and said, Sir, um, basically, in a nutshell, we're done here, and I'm, I'm considering surrender. Wainwright had those orders. He told the aide that came to give, deliver him that message, tell General King... There will be no surrender. The aide looked at him and said, uh, you know what that means, don't you? And he said, I know. Two days later, General King actually wound up surrendering. And General Wainwright said, I don't blame him a bit. But I was under orders, and that's what I had to do. The same day, <clears throat> the same day, um, President Roosevelt sent this to General Wainwright. 
this is this winds up being on April 9th, the the same day that uh, King wound up surrendering. President Roosevelt sent this to General Wainwright. I'm clean, ke keenly aware of the tremendous difficulties under which you're uh, waging your great battle. The physical exhaustion of your troops obviously precludes the possibility of a major counterstrike unless our effort to rush food to you should quickly prove successful. Because of the state uh, over which your forces have no control, I'm modifying my orders to you as contained in my telegram to General MacArthur February 9 uh, and repeated to you March 23, no, uh, the no surrender note. My purpose is to leave to your best judgment any decision affecting the future of the Bataan garrison. And he goes on, basically, that afternoon, he got new orders. Uh, you know what? It's up to you. Things had gotten so bad, and there was no hope. He said, the President of the United States told MacArthur, and it got to General Wainwright, uh, we're modifying those no surrender orders. You do what's best. And nobody likes to lose. That was on April 9th. And they're stuck in those tunnels on Corregidor. That's a picture of a Japanese t taking a, leading a bunch of American and Philippine soldiers captive. And they're, they're, they're bombing that place mercilessly. And from the time he got that note on April 9th, with permission to surrender, he stayed for another month on that island, being shelled continuously. Air raids going over. They had nothing to even stop the, even, even you know, thwart the air raid attacks. The air, the, air, the air raids could be perfectly accurate because there wasn't anybody shooting at them. Just pounded and pounded and pounded and pounded. Listen, the enemy has got no, no use for having any mercy on you. You think the devil's gonna wind up being nice to you in hell? Those Japanese just mercilessly pounded that island over and over and over and over. And food is running out, supplies are running out, weapons are running out, everything, all hope is lost, just like on that shipwreck. And you get up, you get up to, uh, to May, May. You got, the, you got permission to surrender in April, April 9th. You get all the way up to May 6th. Brethren, that's a month. And General Wainwright was finally faced with the decision that he had to make, that he had to surrender. Sometimes you can't avoid failures. It was either that or just let everybody get mercilessly killed. He, uh, he, he got a message together, broadcast it over the radio, letting the, uh, general, uh, the general of the Japanese army know that he was surrendering. He sent uh, a, an aide to tell the, the Japanese general he was surrendering. He sent a telegram telling the Japanese he was surrendering. He said, at 12 o'clock noon, we are going to cease fire. And we are giving you an unconditional surrender of all the troops that I have here. Eleven o'clock rolled around. That shelling is still coming in and in and in. It said the 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 uh, the night before that, for there was a five-hour period where that shelling was so intense, these huge bombs, that they said one shell hit every. Five seconds for five hours from the heavy guns on Bataan. In addition to the airstrikes that were going on. Every five seconds, a 200 and some pound bomb. <clears throat> they said during that five time, just they were <laughs> hunkered down in the, in, the, in the tunnel, just waiting it out because there was nothing else to do. They, they calculated it out. In that, time, in that time, there was 1,800,000 pounds of explosives launched at that little island. So General Wainwright decides it's time to surrender. 
He broadcasts it. He says, at noon o'clock, we're cease firing. We're going to surrender. Um, we've been defeated. 11 o'clock comes up. Uh, 11 o'clock in the morning rolls around, and they're still shelling them. He says, resend the message. Send all that information again. Run up the white flag. 11.45 runs around. They're still shelling. He's He's getting on the radio, he's trying to contact the Japanese, going, guys, we're surrendering. At 12 o'clock, the Americans cease fire. Everybody, the, that gave time for the orders to go out. Everybody drop your guns. He told all of them, destroy everything you got. The Americans now have now destroyed all their weapons because they're surrendering. They've destroyed any supplies or of any value at all. And General Wainwright, with his, with his uh, entourage, gets up on a, a you know, white flag. The enemy's within sight of the tunnel, just a couple hundred yards away on the island. And he goes over to them under the, a white flag, surrendering, and the Japanese continue to shell the island. And he can't figure it out. We're surrendering. What's going on? He gets over, he gets over to... Uh, to the Japanese that, that, that's there and, you know, asked to be taken over to, uh, you know, to the, the commanding general of the Japanese forces and some lieutenant is, some lieutenant is, is uh, talking to him about, he's interpreting, but he's saying, no, we don't accept your surrender. And they continued shelling and shelling and shelling. You think the devil, devil's going to give you a reprieve? Shelling the hospital, shelling when they're trying to surrender. And General Wainwright's doing everything he can. He said, I'm not going to listen to this, basically this little punk lieutenant. <laughs> take, me to the, take me to your commanding officer. And they go up and he has a meeting face to face with a commanding officer, the general of the Japanese army. And uh, the, the general says, uh, in a nutshell, surrender everything, and including all the stuff that he's not even in charge of. And he said, I can't. I'm not in charge of that. Then we don't accept your surrender. And they continued to bomb them and shell them. When they were trying to surrender, I tell you what you learn by defeat sometimes. Sometimes you learn just how bad the enemy really is. See, we like to joke a lot of times. Oh, yeah, <laughs> when I die, I'm going to go to hell and party with all my friends. <laughs> That's because you haven't suffered a real defeat where you had a chance to see what the enemy was really like. Amen? Amen? The enemy doesn't have your best interests. The devil does not have your best interests in mind at all. That's the entrance of the tunnel. Just completely obliterated. There was uh, before before he surrendered. There was um, uh, a. a an opportunity they had been working on to try to get some of the nurses off the island and some of the, some of the staff that MacArthur specifically wanted. There were some code breakers and some intelligence people that <laughs> he needed and he had sent for them. And they had tried several different ways, weren't able to do it because the attack had been so heavy. But they finally got two planes to come in and under cover of night and land. And General Wainwright made up a list. <laughs> These people get to go. You got, a, you got room for 50 people. <laughs> That's it. He goes, try being the one who makes a decision on which 50 people go. Well, one of the people that he put on the list was the, um, uh, the, chief, the chief nurse, uh, a, a Captain uh, Myler. And he put her on the list to get her out of there. He put, a, he put uh, almost, you know, as many of the nurses that he could on and, and, you know, some of the other people that MacArthur had specifically asked for. And he got a, a courier that came back to him, and the courier told uh, General Wainwright this, uh, Captain Myler, she refuses to leave. 
She said this. She said uh, she did not choose to leave as long as there is a patient in the hospital. He looked at the cur and he goes, does she know what she's asking for? Yep, she knows. That's something, man. That's something. And then, like I said, all that happened. The bottom line is, listen, when you, sometimes going through defeat shows you what your enemy is really like. And he found out. And the devil is a thousand times worse than anything you could ever even imagine that men face in war. If you're sitting here this morning, you've never trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. You know why that is? Because you haven't faced defeat enough to see what the enemy is really like. If you had a glimpse of what he was really like, you would run to the Lord Jesus Christ as fast as you could. Amen? I have, uh, I'm, I'm looking at time. Um, I have another point that, you know, facing defeat properly helps inspire others. There's a lot of people that watch this general as he went through all of this, and they took great courage and great, um, you know, gave him great boldness to watch this general go through, even in the face of defeat. And, you know, again, sometimes there's a reason to go through some defeat. Um, and and this, this Captain Miller saw this, and she was inspired. She was inspired to rise up to a level of, of courage most of us will never even have to deal with. It inspires others. You go through defeat and you do it properly. Hey, everyone's going to go through defeat. But how you go through it, it's going to make a big impact. You're going to find out who you are. You're going to find out who the enemy is. And you know what? If you go through it properly, you're going to wind up inspiring a lot of other people along the way. Amen. Amen? It, inspires, it inspires other people. And finally, finally, I'll wrap things up because we're, we're out of time. Facing defeat... Facing defeat is required for some victories. Say, so what do you mean by that? Well, for all of sin and come short of the glory of God. Talk about salvation this morning. Heaven or hell? You know the story of Adam and Eve. One sin cursed all of mankind. Kicked him out of the garden. Right? The Bible says, for all of sin and come short of the glory of God. For there is none righteous, no, not one. Right? Well, ladies and gentlemen, I know what the enemy's like. I know how merciless the devil is. I don't want to be under, under his control. I don't want to fall into his hands. I don't want to fall into the devil's hands and say, just be nice to me while I'm in hell. Because I know what will happen. But you know what? The only way that I can find the victory of salvation <laughs> is by realizing I've been defeated by sin. Yes. Amen. Amen. I have got to get to the point where I go, you know, I'm just not as good as I like for people to think. And God, uh, you know my heart. You know my thoughts. Amen. You know what I've done. And Lord, sin, sin, as young as I am right now, sin has gotten me. I've been defeated by sin. I can't be good enough. I can't be good enough to get to heaven. How do you be perfect? You can't. 
So there are some defeats that you have to go through in order to, fight, to get victory. If you're lost here this morning, you've got to, you've got to realize you've been defeated by sin. Amen. And when you realize that, there's hope for a victory. Amen. But if you think, if you think, oh, I haven't sinned that much. I haven't been that bad. You haven't been defeated yet. You don't know how bad the enemy really is. You really don't know yourself. <laughs> you're certainly not going to be an inspiration to others as you're screaming in a lake of fire. But when you realize that you have been defeated by sin, you can turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, I know that you are God. I know that you died on the cross for me to pay for my sins. You shed your blood to pay for my sins. You rose again the third day. Lord, I want you as my Savior. Amen. Because that's the only victory I can ever have. Amen. So you've got to be defeated by sin before you can get the victory of salvation. Amen? So while all of us like to win, and I'm done, well, all of us like to win. All of us would love to have an 8,829 game winning streak. Unfortunately, we're going to face many more defeats than what we realize. But there's things we can learn out of those defeats. Amen? There's things we can learn. In the end, that's General Wainwright on the left standing up, the skinny one. In the end, even after facing that defeat, as bad as it was, he made it through three years of a POW camp. And then he's there on the Missouri as Japan surrenders. He won a victory. But he had to face, he had to face some defeats along the way. Amen? If you're lost here this morning, that's what it's going to be like when you get to heaven. If you get saved. You get to stand up. The devil can accuse you all, you all he wants of your sins. And the Lord Jesus Christ says, he won the victory because I paid for his sins. Amen. 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 That declaration of, of uh, surrender is signed by the devil. There are some defeats along the way for us. But in the end, the devil loses. I hope you get saved today. Christian, I hope you realize that you just look at defeats a little bit differently. Defeats can show you what you're made of. They'll definitely show you what the enemy's like. If you go through them properly, you'll, you'll be an inspiration to others. And unfortunately, it's true, sometimes they're necessary so that you can attain certain victories. Amen? So while every one of us wants to win... Don't let the defeats kick you out of the battle. Because in the end, in the end, I know who's going to win. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Father, thank you again for uh, a chance to be here on a Sunday morning. You are a, a great, a mighty, and a holy God. <clears throat> Father, um, I know that every single one of us in life has faced uh, defeats, and those are, defeats are discouraging. But Lord, there is, uh, there's some things that we can learn out of that. And Father, just getting our mind and putting those things in perspective will help our Christian life. Uh, Father, Paul had to face some things in his life, but in the end, he knew that it was you that was protecting him, guiding him, and going to take care of him. And I know that we as Christians need to understand that as well. Help us to remember that. Father, most of all, if there's somebody here who is not saved, uh, who's never trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. Lord, I pray that they would realize that um, as, as they face defeats, they'll get a glimpse of what the, the devil is really like. And he is not their friend. And he is not going to help them. And he is not going to be merciful to them in the end. And even if they were to try to surrender to him, the devil would just continue to put on the pressure and continue to crush. He's not interested in surrender. So, Father, if there's somebody here who's never been saved, I pray that they would see the enemy for what he really is 
and that they would turn to the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.